much a, a talk. It's probably going to put uh, a lot of you on the spot because we're going to have it pretty interactive. Um, what I'm essentially going to be presenting is, is a really interesting case, um, but really the thinking behind the case. So what we'll try to do is if you can have your Slido sort of open, um, I mean, you don't, you know, if you're obviously telephone averse, you don't need to, but it will just help with uh, sort of gauging the responses in the room. Um, and because uh, I'll be taking you through the case and asking questions, the kind of questions that I was posed with uh, as we go through the case and then take you all the way through the outcome. Uh, through that as well, I'll be outlining some uh, very recent um, data about trauma. So the, the talks that I'll be doing will be sort of mental health. We know that mental health and substances are uh, comorbid. Um, I won't be focusing so much on the substances, but taking you through neurobiology of trauma, um, the neurobiology of the brain in, in psychosis, depression, and of course, targeting medication. So that's what we're going to be doing. Um, so this is sort of um, a three to four year lifespan of a patient that I'll be taking you in the next sort of 20 minutes, and we'll do it um, sort of interactively. If anyone's got any issues with Slido and wants to use it and is having any issues, please raise your hand because uh, um, Jess or Mim um, or Yana will come and help you um, out with that. Okay, uh, so let's get started. So this is the case. I've seen this patient for the last four years. This is a 57-year-old Caucasian female who was adopted um, as a child. Um, with an extreme, quite severe history of childhood sexual abuse, presenting with severe depressive symptomatology when I first saw her, with suicidal ideation and documented suicidal attempts, very serious suicidal attempts. Uh, the patient has an additional diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis and is on methotrexate as well. The patient has documented previous episode of mania. So the first question, we'll be switching through, yeah. So the first question asks you, regarding trauma neurobiology, which of the following best describes the combination that occurs in patients with trauma or PTSD? Is it increased cortisol and increased noradrenaline? Increased cortisol and decreased noradrenaline? Decreased cortisol and decreased noradrenaline? Decreased cortisol and increased noradrenaline? Or normal at noradrenaline increase? This one decrease cortisol and increase noradrenaline. So this is from the latest uh, Nature Reviews of Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. And this is one of the reasons why post-traumatic stress disorder is highly associated with inflammatory conditions, so people with trauma, uh, with inflammatory conditions, and also have a very high mortality rate, almost very similar to, um, in terms of schizophrenia, uh, 20 years before the general population. Um, so in your booklets, the Psych Insights booklet, uh, there is an article in this neurobiology of um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's been summarized from um, the Nature Reviews. So a really, really interesting article. Yeah, uh, you are allowed to cheat, of course, yeah. All right, so let's have a look at the, the next one. The interesting thing about increased noradrenaline is that noradrenaline is necessary for consolidation of memories. So for example, when we're uh, you know, giving exams, we need a certain amount of noradrenaline, a certain amount of stress to help consolidate what we're learning. But in trauma, uh, what tends to happen is all these negative memories get uh, consolidated as well. So if they were entering this room, for example, and heard a loud noise, um, because their noradrenaline is elevated, this particular event will be consolidated in their memory as a negative event. And you can imagine as they go along life, uh, they start becoming avoidant because all these different um, uh, sort of events become associated with negative memories. Okay, so this is the other question on phenotypes, which is really, really interesting. The patient presents with emotional detachment and numbing along with depersonalization and derealization, which was the initial presentation. If considering a diagnosis of complex trauma disorder, so this is the individuals that have had repetitive um, abuse in childhood, which PTSD phenotype does this entail? Is it emotional undermodulation, and I'll explain this in a bit, or emotional overmodulation, or emotional dysregulation? And, and these three phenotypes are really the battle between your frontal lobe and the threat area of the brain, which is the limbic system. So the question is, which phenotype does this patient present with when they're presenting with numbing and depersonalization, derealization? A few minutes, there's 46. 
51. All right, let's have a look. Yeah, spot on. It is emotional overmodulation. So essentially what this um, entails, and I'll show you in the slide later, is that the frontal lobe is having a significant inhibitory effect on the limbic mood area, and therefore the person presents with emotional numbing. Okay, let's have a look at the next question. All right, okay. Um, I think, all right, so let's, yeah, I'll show you the two slides. That's right, Jess, thank you. Um, so we switch back to the presentation. So this is what I was talking about um, earlier. You, the, the trauma basically is associated with increased noradrenergic activity, but cortisol, which is necessary for reducing noradrenaline, is low. And that's why you have unopposed noradrenaline input resulting in negative consolidation of memories. And these are the two phenotypes that have been, mentioned, that have been outlined in the um, Nature Review. Uh, the emotional undermodulation and overmodulation. The undermodulation is that the frontal lobe is not inhibiting the limbic system adequately, as a result of which there's limbic or amygdala hyperactivity, and the patient presents with heightened emotional responses. So from a clinical perspective, it's helpful to think about what part of the brain do we need to address. So strengthening the frontal lobe and calming the limbic system down would be the, the, you know, the optimal approach. Okay. So I think we go back to we go back to slide on go to the next question. Which phenomenon does the following represent? Uh, the process through which, so the process through which increasingly low stimuli can activate negative responses over time. What is that process known as? The process through which increasingly low stimuli activating negative responses over time is it sensitization? Is it habituation? Kindling? Extinction? or desensitization. All right, let's have a look. The answer is kindling, but sensitization is the other process that plays a very, very important role. But kindling essentially means that, as it says there, increasingly low stimuli can activate negative responses. And this is a key issue in individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder, complex trauma disorder, that we see relapses happen with, with smaller stimuli over um, time. Sensitization is a process where their illness continues to sort of get worse over time. Um, because habituation and extinction isn't happening. Um, so the aim with post-traumatic stress disorder treatments is to reach the process of habituation and extinction, whether it's through exposure therapy, combination of, um, of pharmacological therapy. Okay. Have a look at the slides. I think we switch over. Okay. So the patient um, rec receives so what, what happens with this patient is that the patient is very, very unwell. There's suicidal ideation. And the patient received electroconvulsive therapy for a severe depressive symptomatology. And bear in mind, I'm giving you sort of snippets. This is you know, not the first presentation. Um, this is over an extended period of time. Um, severe depressive symptomatology that was ceased after the onset of hypomanic symptoms. A provisional diagnosis was then considered to be bipolar affective disorder, so certainly at least a bipolar trait complex post-traumatic stress disorder, and alcohol use disorder, which was in remission. Her medication was the following, asenapine, which is an antipsychotic medication, 10 milligrams twice a day, lithium XR, 900 milligrams at nighttime, lamotrigine, 200 milligrams, quetiapine, 200 milligrams, and clonidine, 300. So just have a look at those medications. And the question is, which of the above medications, which of the ones that we mentioned, has anti-suicidal properties? Is it quetiapine, lithium, asenapine, clonidine, or lamotrigine, which is anticonvulsant? All right, let's have a look. Yeah, absolutely, lithium. So a very, very big meta-analysis by Cipriani. Uh, it's recently been updated as well. We're looking at a risk reduction of 74%, uh, a very, very strong signal for um, and, you, you know, anti-suicidal properties. Uh, we will see the other one in psychiatry as we go through the case. Um, 
All right, moving on to the next bit. Now, this patient, as you can see, was in a centipede 10 milligrams twice a day. Now, this is not that patient, but I'm showing you a video. And the question will ask you, so let me play this. Um, okay, so the question is, go back to Slido. Which side effect is being shown in the video? Is it tardive dyskinesia? Is it Parkinsonian symptoms? Is it akathisia? Or is it dystonia? All right, let's have a look. Yeah, absolutely. It's Parkinsonian symptoms. You could see the pill rolling tremor. So, uh, tardive dyskinesia occurs over a longer time, usually orofacial, so a lot of chewing movements with antipsychotic medication. Let's have a look at the next question. The next... Yeah. So what is the mechanism of Parkinsonian side effects? So this sort of links in with this, the smoking in a way, the, the alcohol, because we're looking at dopamine pathways, the reward pathways. Is it the D2 antagonism in the mesolimbic pathway? Is it D2 antagonism in the nigrostriatal pathway? D2 antagonism in the tuber infundibular pathway? D2 antagonism in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex? Or D2 antagonism in the medial frontal cortex? So you can see lots of parts of the brain, and we've really got to think about um, you know, which pathways are affected, because many of these patients will be utilizing smoking as a way of self-medicating. All right, let's have a look. Yes, yeah, spot on. So it is D2 antagonism in the nigrostriatal pathway which is the same pathway that's involved in Parkinson's disease. 